Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Brenda Smeaton, and I'm the legal director at Georgia Justice Project. And I am joined by two of my colleagues, Wade Askew, our policy manager, and Ann Colleton, UJP's policy and outreach coordinator. We also have two very special guests today, Reverend Dr. John Vaughn, executive pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church, and Ms. Marilyn Wynn, senior fellow and co-founder of Women on the Rise. So our plan for the next hour is to give an overview of where we've been with criminal record clearing reform in Georgia, a little bit about the current state of the law, and then talk about where we need to go from here. As we go along, Anne will be keeping an eye out for questions in the Q&A, and if we have a few minutes at the end, we will answer some of them live. Before I do uh, jump in, I want to be clear about what we are talking about when we slate, when we say clean slate, because sometimes people will use the words clean slate just to refer to kind of any, you know, any attempts to clear people's criminal records. But more commonly in the way that we're using it here today is to describe the movement that has been gaining traction around the country for the last five to seven years to create a system of expunging criminal records that is automatic. So what happens under a clean slate law is certain criminal records are expunged after a period of time without the individual who has the record having to take any action to do that. So there's no forms to fill out or applications, no court hearings or fees, no balancing tests where you have to go before the judge and prove you are worthy of getting your record cleared or have suffered enough barriers because of your record. It's just that eligible records are sealed using computer programming and technology. And that way, everyone who is eligible to have the record cleared can do so. So Wade, Wade's gonna talk more about this later. Also, I do wanna mention before we get started that this webinar is just about policy. We will not be talking about how you can clear your record, just giving a brief summary of eligibility. You can find out more information about how you can clear your record and how to attend one of our first Friday sessions or apply for services at Georgia Justice Project at gjp.org. And, and we'll be putting some, some links in the chat box about that. All right. So I, I know most of you who, or many of you at least, who are listening today are probably very familiar with us. So I don't want to spend a, a lot of time talking about that. What I will say is that at Georgia Justice Project, we believe the criminal legal system has been used to divide us from one another and to exclude certain people, but that a better Georgia is possible. So we work with partners across the political spectrum to advance practical solutions to address the harm of the criminal legal system. All of our work is guided by two overarching goals. One, to reduce the number of Georgians under correctional control, and two, to reduce barriers to reentry. So we have been representing individuals at Georgia Justice Project for the last 36 years, and our core programs include holistic criminal defense, criminal record clearing, removing holds and detainers for people in prison, specifically one prison, the Metro Reentry Facility in Atlanta, and also assisting folks with early termination of their probation. I did want to mention two new programs that we are really excited about. In October, we launched Restorative Justice Georgia, which is a program that will address felony harm through a facilitated restorative justice process. So we're going to receive referrals from several different local district attorneys that we are, we are just getting ready to sign MOUs with who want to participate in the program. And you can learn more about that program and how you can potentially volunteer on our website. And the other new program, which will be launched launching later next spring is a warrant clinic. So stay tuned for more information about that. So I, I do want to dive a little bit deeper into our criminal records work because it, it is our direct representation and our history of doing that that really informs our policy agenda and our policy, how we approach the policy work to expand record clearing. So in about 2005, at the request of a few local foundations, we began representing hundreds of individuals who were being displaced when the housing projects in Atlanta were being torn, torn down to make way for development. 
and they could not get a voucher due to their criminal record. So we worked with an army of volunteers and we were able to get a voucher for all but two of them. And that was our entry point into criminal records. In 2007, uh, a recent law school grad named Marissa McCall Dotson came to GJP under a two year fellowship to help us establish a permanent um, service of record clearing and also to work work to expand Georgia's record clearing law, which was very, very limited at that point. So over the next seven years, she did she did just that. So as many of you know, we lost her last year, but it's always important for me to recognize that she is always going to be a part of the history of record clearing in Georgia. So over the years, we have really worked to expand our record clearing program due to the overwhelming need for assistance. In 2014, we launched our volunteer clinic that has trained hundreds of attorneys from firms and corporations, solo practitioners to assist individuals with their record. In 2016, we worked with a bunch of partners in Fulton County to hold the first ever record clearing summit or event in Georgia. And that was held at Ebenezer Baptist Church just around the corner from our office. Since then, we have worked with local stakeholders around the state to host uh, about 55 to 60 of these one day record clearing events. And I say one day, um, but there's usually months of work that goes into preparing for that day. And during the pandemic, of course, we had to slow down on these events and, and cancel some of them, but it's picking back up. We have an amazing criminal records team and we are we are back in action moving around the state to do those events. We had one a couple of weeks ago down in Glynn County, and we have some staff that's going to be in Columbus this coming Saturday. Also, um, our, our last sort of expansion effort was in 2021 when we launched the first Second Chance Desk, and that is located in Cobb County. Um, that has been an amazing way for us to work with local stake stakeholders to get a lot of people to be able to clear their record quickly and efficiently. And I did want to let you know that we are working and very close to being able to finalize plans to open two more second chance desks in the state in um, in Augusta and in Athens, hopefully by, by March of next year. So due to all of those efforts to um, you expand our representation and services. We represented and consulted with just over 2,000 people about their record last year, and, and this expansion is necessary. And we're, you know, we're we're very thrilled that we've been able to do that. But it's still woefully insufficient to meet the demand for record clearing due to the scope of the issue of criminal records. And this is why clean slate is really needed. So anyone who has ever been arrested for a fingerprintable offense has a, a criminal record in Georgia. In Georgia, 4.5 million people have a Georgia criminal history. So of course, this is this is a huge, huge number. Many of them were never convicted or they were, um, many of them were convicted of misdemeanors. So a misdemeanor is any crime where the potential sentence is a year or less but over um, 645,000 of them have been convicted of a felony in Georgia. And we all know that felonies can impose the, the steepest barriers for folks that can often last a lifetime. And a felony is any crime where the potential sentence is, is more than a year. So, and also I just wanna know that in spite of the fact that um, you know, over somewhere around 62 to 64% of the people convicted of a felony in Georgia are not sent to prison. So they're not deemed a threat. They're still in our communities. They receive a sentence of probation only, but still they pick up this mark of having a felony on their record that can impose a barrier to them. So why do we care about criminal records so much at Georgia Justice Project? Um, so there's many reasons. First and foremost, there are racial disparities in both who gets a record and how those records are used to deny people opportunity. So dispar racial disparities in um, policing, arrest practices, access to diversion, charging decisions, every single step of the criminal legal system is infected 
with racism. And as a result of this, if you are black, you are much more likely to have a criminal record. And then once you get a criminal record, it is much more likely to be used to deny you opportunity. So for example, there have been some studies that looked at the, the effect of having a record. And one study found that any job applicant um, or a job applicant that has any criminal record at all, even just an arrest, um, has about a 50% lower chance of getting a call back for an interview than an applicant without a record. But what the study found is that if you're black, that negative impact of having a record is much more pronounced. So when we're dealing with criminal records and employment and housing, we're dealing with the intersection of discrimination against people with records and racial discrimination. Collateral consequences, uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with this idea. So these are the, you know, the over 48,000, some people say on up to 52,000 laws and regulations that deny opportunity um, through for people with a record. Over 70% of these laws around the country are related to employment. And this leads to unemployment for folks and underemployment, which has a huge impact on the economy as a whole. One study, and this is a number of years old, so it's probably higher now, showed that the US is losing $87 billion a year in GDP because of the unemployment and underemployment of folks that have a record. And this is in spite of the fact that every single study that's ever been done on the issue has said the best way to present recidivism for people to be able to access opportunity is through steady employment. And still we have imposed all these barriers to make that difficult for folks. Um, lastly, um, I wanted to mention just the simple fact that your past should not follow you around for the rest of your life. You should be able to move on and not have to continually worry about and explain your record and deal with the trauma of the uncertainty of what it's going to mean every time you go to look for a new place to live or find a job to deal with that record. So now I am going to turn it over to Reverend Vaughn to talk a little bit about his and Ebenezer's interest in and commitment to this issue. Thank you, Brenda. So as Brenda mentioned, we got involved as a congregation in 2016 in terms of record restriction work. And it was, and that was really the moment where folks actually would come, you know, would line up and and then would come into the church and there would be multiple tables. So it would be the one-stop shop where all of the you all the folks you needed to talk to were in one place, and then including a judge who was present to be able to do the actual sealing of records. And I have to say that Pastor Warnock oftentimes says that this was one of the proudest moments of his ministry to see people who could come in that day and really get their record restricted. And all of a sudden, it just opened all kinds of doors for people. One of the things I think was important for us as a church and why we were approached was I think folks needed needed to feel there was a trust that they could that this wasn't a sting, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a, a ploy, but that this could actually be a real ministry and opportunity for folks. And so we were really excited about that one. And then we did a follow-up record restriction event at the temple. We've had a long uh, long working history with the temple and and then going forward since then we have worked closely with the temple around record restriction events usually happening once or twice a year um, one of the things that has also evolved since we first did it is that the solicitor general's office this uh, and the Fulton County DA have actually dedicated staff people to now lead this work. And they've also begun to, to take on more of the kind of pre-work. So instead of folks having to walk in and then go around to multiple tables, they actually begin to do some of that pre-work uh, before even the record restriction event. And so when people come, a lot of that pre-work actually has been done. There may be a, lot, a few extra steps that need to happen, and then they get their record sealed. The other thing we've started to do over the last couple of years is 
we've also been um, adding job fairs to it. And so at one, we had MARTA, we had restaurants. And so literally you could get your record restricted, go across the room, do an interview with MARTA or do an interview at a restaurant. And, and some folks actually left with jobs. And so it was really seeing it in live and in action. Um, so we think that we're excited about this idea of the clean slate registration so that you know folks don't have to go through all of these processes. I mean, the thing that is really, even on Zoom, what's moving is people just tell these stories and they just sob when they when they realize what has happened and what has opened up for them. And so we feel that to be able to provide a space for that um, is really a great ministry for us. I will say that um, what we've also done has been we have launched a national effort uh, that's a faith-rooted effort called the Multi-Faith Initiative to End Mass Incarceration. And we are, one of the things that we have been doing has been promoting, uh, and we, we provided a toolkit for how congregations can help support record restriction work. And so um, we want to continue to promote this, and I think it's going to be great to get more clean slate legislation so that you don't have to go through all of these steps. Um, so we're really excited about that. The last thing I'll say is I will um, I will pass along to, uh, I think you'll see in the chat is, we actually have a conference coming up in January, the 11th to the 13th here in Atlanta, where uh, it'll actually focus on faith communities, but others are welcome, um, which is how do we really galvanize uh, kind of faith voices in a much more cohesive and strategic way? and this record restriction work and clean slate is an important part of that agenda. So excited to have you here and excited that you're learning more and will be part of the movement to help us make the make clean slate a reality here within Georgia. So I will kick it back to Brenda. Thank you so much, Reverend Vaughn. Uh, we appreciate your partnership um, and all the important work that you and the faith community do to help shift the narrative around people with criminal records, you know, who are our neighbors, our, our brothers, our, our mothers, and um, really try to get rid of these ideas that people have about who it is that has a criminal record. So thank you so much for being here today. All right, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the history of reform and current law before we get into talk about where we go now. Um, so while it is definitely not gone as quickly or as far as we would like, and there have been a lot of bumps in the road of trying to expand, expand the law, we have had several expansions over the last 10 years. So. I want you to know that we always go, you know, we start with what what could we dream of? What do we want um, the law to be like? And we start with an expansive plan. And but then the reality is we have to go to the legislature and we have to negotiate um, with a lot of different lawmakers who have particular ideas of records um, that they think shouldn't be eligible and you know what the waiting period should be. Um, so we don't always get what we would like, um, but we have been able to, to get something across the finish line several times in the last 10 years. So the, the first major reform was in 2012, and this is when Georgia created our, our current process uh, of record clearing, which is called restriction and sealing. It's a two-step process. So I've been using the word expungement. We use the word expungement frequently in our materials. It was in the, you know, the subtitle of this event. It's what most people are familiar with when they think of record clearing. They're going to go online and Google, you know, how do I expunge my record? But Georgia stopped using the word expungement in our actual law in 2012 because they said that it implied that the records are destroyed and, and records aren't actually destroyed in Georgia. It's just that access to them is restricted. So in Georgia, um, you can get your record restricted, but it remains available to, to law enforcement, but an employer or a housing provider would not be able to see it. So restriction 
means that the record is uh, unavailable through um, our official state database, the GCIC, the, the crime, Georgia Crime Information Center. It's a division of the GBI and they keep track of criminal records in Georgia. So when you get your record restricted, you're making it so anybody that were, if they were to pull your GCIC report, they wouldn't see um, that arrest or that the results of that arrest. Um, we expanded in 2012, we expanded access to restriction of non convictions and we made the first convictions eligible. It, it was very limited. Um, so it was just certain misdemeanor offenses that a person was convicted of before they turned 21 years old. So a lot of people, we had to say no to a lot of people that were still excluded from getting any kind of conviction off their record. Also, probably most important for that law is the first time that we created a path to seal court records. So that's that second part of restriction and sealing our, our record clearing process in Georgia. And what sealing does is it means we are sealing the actual court records or the clerk's records um, for charges that have been restricted. And the reason that this is so important is because most employers or landlords, they're not gonna check your record through GCIC. They're gonna pull a private background check um, report and those reports are pulling their data from the actual court records. So this two-step process where you get your record restricted on GCI first, and then the second step, you get the record sealed um, at the court. So it's not gonna show up on those background check reports. It's not gonna show up when someone goes down to the courthouse to try to, to pull your record. In 2015, another uh, big win that we had um, we created a way for people who had not been sentenced as a first offender when their case was originally resolved to be retroactively sentenced as a first offender. So to, to go back in time and get the paperwork changed so that they were sentenced as a first offender. So under the First Offender Act, if you're familiar with it, if you have no prior felonies and you've never used first offender before, you can be sentenced under this law. And if you successfully complete your sentence, then it's not a conviction at all and then it can potentially um, be, be both restricted and sealed from your record. So this law allows us to, to do just that, to go back in time and get first offender for people that should have received it the first time around when their case was being handled. Our biggest gains in expungement eligibility came in the 2020 session um, with Senate Bill 288, which was sponsored by Senator Tanya Anderson. Um, and what Senate Bill 288 did is it created this path for misdemeanor conviction restriction and sealing that wasn't limited by age and it made pardon felony convictions eligible. So it's the first time that we are really getting to any felonies other than folks that might be eligible for retro first offender. Also that same year, it wasn't a law that we at Georgia Justice Project worked on or drafted, but the legislature created a, a powerful remedy for survivors of sex or labor trafficking to be able to vacate or seal their convictions. So some of you on this call, I know probably signed on to the Second Chance for Georgia campaign that Anne in our office led, and we were able to take a big leap forward in expanding access to record clearing due to organizations and individuals and also support from the business community to be able to get the legislature to move on that and expand expungement of convictions. So this is just a little bit more of an explanation of what we were able to accomplish by working together on that campaign. We um, expanding access to restriction and sealing of misdemeanor convictions and pardoned felony convictions. So as I noted on the prior slide, several large Georgia corporations and the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce were very involved in that effort. The chamber actually helped us draft language that provides some of the strongest liability protections for employers who engage in second in fair chance hiring. So some of the strongest protections in the country are here in Georgia for employers. Um, so we, one of the things we do is we do a lot of work around the state trying to connect with employers and make sure that they understand um, that the law does provide these new protections for them. So where does this leave us? Where are we today in what is the state of record clearing law in Georgia? So where we are now is most non-convictions on your record can be restricted and sealed. So let's say I'm arrested for theft by shoplifting or drug possession, and then for whatever reason, my charges don't result in a conviction. So they're dismissed, or maybe I complete a diversion program, or even I go to trial and I found, I'm found not guilty. Um, 
or if I had first offender or conditional discharge, which is, is a similar law to first offender. So then um, in most cases, um, there are some exceptions. I am gonna be eligible to have my record restricted and then to file a motion to have that record sealed. So it's not going to show up when I go to apply for a job. And employers will sometimes use those non-convictions against you. So, so it, that is important. Um, but convictions, of course, impose the biggest barrier. So where are we with convictions? We have three potential ways to deal with both misdemeanor and felony convictions with some different eligibility, depending on whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. So our most, um, one of our most powerful remedies that I mentioned before is retroactive first offender. So you can use that for either a misdemeanor or a felony, but you can only use it once in your lifetime. Our second option for misdemeanor convictions and felony convictions is restriction, restriction and sealing. So under the law that passed in 2020, a person can potentially restrict and seal up to two misdemeanor conviction incidents on their record. And they can do, yeah, do that four years after they were convicted, as long as they haven't been convicted of anything in the meantime. It is a lifetime limit of, of just two misdemeanor convictions. And for felonies, there's no limit on the number of felony convictions that you could potentially get restricted and sealed from your record, but there's this huge thing that you have to do before you're even eligible to ask the court to seal your record. And that is you have to apply for a pardon and you have to be granted a pardon by the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. So that is a remedy that's available to a small number of people, people that, that obtain this pardon. It's about 450 to 500 people a year in Georgia that are able to get a pardoned felony, um, a felony conviction pardoned, and then they can go to the court and ask that to be restricted and sealed. There are some, for every category of record clearing, there are some excluded offenses. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, the Survivors First Act, which allows us to clear records of convictions, no matter what the offense was. Um, a lot of times people might associate um, trafficking, like sex trafficking with just prostitution offenses or something like that, but it doesn't matter what the offense was. If you were convicted because, um, because you were as a result of being trafficked or while you were being trafficked, we have a powerful way to try to vacate and seal those convictions. So if that's something that might apply to you or someone you know, please, please come see us about that. You can read more about all of these remedies on our website, um, there's a document called Frequently Asked Questions that really summarizes the eligibility for the law. And I mentioned we have a First Friday's presentation every the first Friday of every month, um, and you can go online and you can sign up for that. And that brings us to where we are now with, with record clearing in Georgia. And I'm gonna turn it over to Wade to talk about the important stuff of where we can go from here. All right, thanks so much, Brenda. And uh, to introduce myself briefly, I'm Wade Askew. I'm our policy manager here at Georgia Justice Project. And so while Brenda kind of covered where uh, we are, where we have been and a lot of our direct service work, my job is to try to uh, continue to, to move the needle policy-wise to improve the laws for folks living with criminal records. So. Uh, what I'll do is kind of talk about some of the challenges that folks face under current law, how we might overcome some of those, and kind of the roadmap that, that we see for Georgia as we pursue uh, making Clean Slate a reality. Uh, so first, uh, talking about some of the challenges and some of the barriers that uh, folks with criminal records will face when they you know, go through the real life steps of trying to restrict and seal their record. Uh, like Brenda talked about. So under our current system, we have what you would call a petition-based process. What that means is uh, instead of having a computer do it for me, instead of uh, having an automated system, I have to write a full motion, file that in court, give a copy to a prosecutor, and ultimately uh, have a judge decide in their discretion whether or not to grant my restriction and sealing or expungement. Uh, that is a complicated process. Also, an important note is to say that in, under the current law, I have to submit my petition and go through the process wherever my conviction took place. So if I live in Atlanta, but I have a conviction in Albany, a conviction in Dalton, a conviction in Savannah, 
I'm traveling all over the place. Um, also, we have 156 counties. All jurisdictions might vary a little bit in implementation, exactly what their process is. Are they gonna require me to have a, an in-person hearing when they're deciding on my motion? Are they, do they have some kind of streamlined process? It varies across the state. And so in this sort of patchwork petition-based system, what most states across the country that have something similar experience is that only about 6% of eligible individuals actually get the relief that they are eligible for. In Georgia, you know, we are in a very new reality still. We've only had uh, not even quite two years of having uh, a substantial number of convictions be eligible for expungement. But in those two years, we barely scratched the surface. We are working hard every single day to reach as many people as we can, but only 0.058% of folks who are eligible for expungement in Georgia have gotten it so far in these last two years. Also, we have other challenges of limited eligibility. Like Brenda said at GJP, we, we might start with what we believe should be the reality, but we go through the legislative process. And so what that means is not everyone is eligible that we would like to be eligible for expungement. So right now, uh, like Brenda described, there is a narrow path for folks who have a felony conviction to ultimately get expungement. They first have to go through the pardon process, which only about 450 pardons are given a year. And so when we think about 645,000 individuals with a felony conviction on their record, that's a very narrow path for those folks to be able to try to expunge their record. We also have some exclusions for misdemeanor convictions. While most misdemeanors are eligible for expungement, not all of them are. And so even those, those offenses that are deemed more minor, where the max sentence is one year, not all of them are eligible. And then lastly, folks are only able to expunge up to two misdemeanors in their lifetime. So for those who have three plus misdemeanors, they have to pick two under current law. So the uh, a solution to this in our next slide is a, a potential solution would be clean slate. Um, clean slate would really address many of those process-based challenges that we talked about. As Brenda described, clean slate refers to an automated process of record clearance, no more petitions, no more traveling throughout the state, no more finding an attorney to write a motion for you. How it functions in practice is that a computer would identify who is eligible, what they're eligible for, notify any relevant agencies, so GCIC, the courts, law enforcement, notify them, this person is eligible for restriction and sealing, make that happen in your systems, and then the records are updated in all relevant systems. So, so that entire process should just be a computer automation does not require human intervention. The benefits of this, the, the, the really top level benefit is that it expands the benefit of expungement to those who are eligible. Uh, instead of having just a fraction of people who could get the relief get it, we have a much, much, much wider, hopefully everyone who's entitled to the relief gets it, thanks to the computer just automating the process. And of course that benefit goes from the individuals with the records, but also it, it ripples out into communities, the economy at large. We, we know that the entire communities, employers, the workforce, everybody, all those actors benefit from expungement. It also significantly reduces the burden on courts. So courts, prosecutors, defense attorneys, other government actors, law enforcement agencies, under the current process, a lot of human work is required. And so a clean slate system from those, uh, on those levels would also help ease the burden because the computer now automates what humans are having to do now. And so this, this move to clean slate is a national movement. Uh, so what you see here, this is a screenshot of the Clean Slate Initiative. They're an organization who are committed to uh, using their resources to try to expand clean slate throughout the country. Uh, you can go to their website, find resources, and also get some information on what different states have done around clean slate. And so while 
you know, we, we will kind of lay out our anticipated roadmap for moving Georgia. Um, we would not be the first ones to do this, as I'm sure everyone here knows that other states have taken steps to automate their, their processes, and hopefully more and more states will look to do that. And so with that, I'm very happy to pass the torch to Ms. Marilyn Wynn, our, our friend and a leader in the community. She is the senior, a senior fellow and co-founder of Women on the Rise. So Ms. Wynn. All righty. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Wade and uh, Georgia Justice Project. I'm always so happy to be a part of these discussions when they come up. I have been, um, first of all, I am the senior fellow and co-founder of Women on the Rise, which is an organization that I created just to do what Georgia District Project is doing for women that are coming out of the system. Um, I have been a recipient of just about everything that Georgia Justice Project has uh, won over the many years that I've been involved. I, it's mm -hmm. been so long, I can't even mm -hmm. think uh, how many years that I've been involved. Um, but I know that when I first started with Georgia Justice Project, I had so many um, convictions and felonies and been in prison so many times, there was really nothing that they could do for me from the very beginning. But as time passed, Georgia Justice has been on top of all the laws that have uh, basically um, given people alternatives to, to sentencing. And not only that, being able to help people get jobs, get housing, so they don't have to return to the system. I, like I said, I have been a recipient of maybe every piece of clean slate legisl legislation that uh, Georgia Justice Project has uh, put forward and won. Um, and you know, I would, and I'm a part of the National Clean Slate um, Organization as well. And I work to my 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 goals and my dream is to be in a state where. You don't have to uh, petition for a pardon. I remember when Brenda and I did my pardon, I think it took us about six months or maybe more for her to complete my application for the pardon because I had been arrested so many times. But I did get a pardon. I was able to be, I think, maybe the first person that received the, the uh, record restriction on one of my felonies. Again, um, that was wonderful. And if I had been a person with one felony, that would have been a, a lot better. But me being a person with maybe, I don't know how many I had, maybe 10 or more, um, clean slate could do a lot more. That could be a, a better way to do this. Instead of petitioning, I call it record redemption because uh, that's what it is. And when we are arrested and we come home and we think we're done, and we try to get a job, we try to get housing. That's when we realized we really didn't receive a five-year sentence, but we received a life sentence because that don't happen for us. And with the new clean slate law, I would love for Georgia Justice Project to take on a new um, legislation where people actually don't have to, I mean, petition the courts, petition the board, board of ponds and paroles, but maybe after 10, 15 or 20 years, if a person have not committed a crime, that their record would uh, be restricted from housing, employment, medical. And of course, I know that it's gonna always be with the, um, with the uh, GCIC and with the police department and all those folks. But um, I just love the work that you're doing. I will continue to be a part of it. I will continue and continue until one day, hopefully I'll see where somebody had not been arrested in 40 years and I was able to get housing. And me, myself, I'm 72. I will soon will be 72. And if I didn't have a home, I would be homeless here in Georgia because I have a background and all of my background cannot be restricted. So I would love to continue to work with Georgia Justice Project and be a part of what they're doing to make this come, this, this dream come into fruition where people can actually, after 30 or 40 years, can actually walk into a senior high rise building that is for seniors and say, I want an apartment and they don't be turned away because of something they did 30 or 40 years ago. Thank you so much, Ms. Wynn. Um, for, we're, we're always grateful for your partnership and the leadership that, that you've shown the community. And 
Uh, many lives have been improved thanks to the work of Miss Wynn, Women on the Rise, and uh, the many lives you've touched. So uh, thank you. We'll be continuing to do that work. Thank you. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, in our remaining time, close out by talking about, uh, like I said, a little bit about what other states have done around Clean Slate, and then specifically what we think the roadmap can be here in Georgia. So this again is from the Clean Slate Initiative website. It, it shows you a number of states that have already enacted Clean Slate legislation, as well as a number of states that are uh, on the way to enacting Clean Slate or, or have some pending bills in action. Now, the, the next slide will kind of show us a little bit about what Clean Slate looks like in those states that have begun to implement Clean Slate. So you'll see here that it's different everywhere. Uh, and a lot of states have kind of gone through an evolution in their own Clean Slate journeys. So starting in the top left here, you'll see that some states, when it just speaking to Clean Slate, so again, just speaking to actual, when we say Clean Slate, we're referring to the automated process. These states might have a separate petition process, but just speaking about automated process, what gets cleared through the automated process and what uh, and when does it get cleared? Those are the two major questions that most states have to answer. A number of states have started with a small group of offenses that automatically get cleared. So you see Virginia, South Dakota, Dakota, New Jersey, they only right now are automatically clearing very minor misdemeanor convictions. Other offenses might be eligible in their petition process, but in terms of automation, in terms of clean slate, it's a very small number of offenses that are uh, covered. Now, as you, you look at the other states, we have some that cover most misdemeanors, maybe anything that, uh, any arrest that didn't lead to a conviction. Then we have states that are kind of the furthest down the line It's saying, okay, misdemeanors, and some felony convictions are all under our clean slate statute. And so a number of those even that are in that misdemeanor and some felonies bucket, they may have started much, much uh, smaller. So some of them started around, hey, we're only gonna automatically clear marijuana possession. And then they expanded and then they expanded and then they got to where they are today. And so when we're looking in Georgia at, at clean slate, it might be a journey. Uh, both in terms of eligibility, what our wait times look like, those things, because that's what we've seen in a number of states. Uh, also, just the last note is that you, you can see here that Clean Slate doesn't solve everything. So like I said, uh, they, there still might be limited eligibility. There still might be uh, long wait times. So for some of these states, it's 10 years. So it, Clean Slate in and of itself doesn't necessarily solve every single issue. So we will be trying at the same time to move towards clean slate, move towards automation to solve some of our issues, but at the same time be working on some of our other issues that clean slate in and of itself won't fix. So coming back to Georgia, um, looking at specifically the road to clean slate, we've talked about some of the challenges for I'm an individual, I need to clean my record here today. What are my hurdles gonna be? But let's talk about a little bit of the challenges of moving towards this automated system in Georgia. The first challenge that we have as a state in moving towards clean slate is we have a complicated court system, a non-unified court system. What that means and why that matters is that instead of all of our courts feeding into one data system, remember this is all about computers and data and automation. Instead of everybody feeding into the same system, we have 156 counties, they've got multiple courts. Each of those uh, are using their own data system. And then they're supposed to manually, essentially take their data and feed it into GCIC, uh, basically a central repository of records. And so as you might imagine, in that big of a system where everyone's kind of doing their own thing and then supposed to be feeding in uh, to, to one system, there's missing data. And when there's missing data, that means for clean slate, some people might miss out on the relief. 
And so what, what we need is to improve our data systems so that they are reliable and they're complete so that everybody who needs the relief gets it when a computer goes through and searches for who's eligible. There was a bill this last year, a SB 441, that was aimed at improving our data systems. Really what it did was try to, and is doing, is trying to improve that uh, relay of information from the court level to GCIC. So that is just now uh, coming under implementation. So it's something to track uh, and, and something that, you know, again, we, we, we need that process to get better, to have a clean slate system that reaches as many people as possible. We also have practical issues like some courts or some law enforcement agencies might have old record, old records and physical files instead of on computers. So we don't want those old records that are in physical files to be missed. Uh, and then lastly, as, as Brenda described, we've got our expungement is a two-step process. So we need automation both for the restriction and for the sealing. Now, we also have our challenges around eligibility and th those can feed into uh, things that need to be remedied for a clean slate system, again, to work as efficiently as possible and for the most people that we, that we can reach. So first is the misdemeanor lifetime limit. So the, the fact that folks can only have two misdemeanors expunged in their life. That's problematic for a couple of reasons. The most obvious is folks who have more than two minor offenses in their life are stuck having to pick two and leave the rest uh, not expunged. But then also when we put it in the context of clean slate, it's a whole lot harder for a computer to say, okay, this person, uh, you know, I found a misdemeanor conviction. I can need to match it to a person. Ooh, that person has three or more misdemeanors. Does the computer now pick two? What happens? It, it, it just becomes unworkable. So we need to get rid of that lifetime limit, both to help folks in that situation and also for in the future when we hopefully move towards an automated process that it can work, that it can work well, uh, that the computers can just simply handle, I see a misdemeanor, it is eligible, move forward. Also, like we talked about felony convictions, we have very limited eligibility. Um, we, we talked about having to get the pardon first. One thing to note, uh, we showed in the other states the timing, the, the wait periods that folks have to, to go through in order to expunge their record in a, in a number of states. Here in Georgia, we have the longest probation sentences in the country by far. You can only apply for a pardon five years after your sentence is complete, with sentence being defined as you're done with probation. Um, so what that means is folks are very often have to wait a very long time before they get a pardon. Again, funnel that back into clean slate. That, that means even if we automate the system under the current eligibility, uh, folks are still having to wait a long time to get the relief that they need. So with those in mind, here is just a kind of a snapshot of the roadmap that we see to move towards clean slate and getting the most people the relief that, that they are entitled to and that they need. So first is to clean up current law. St before we automate the system, we need to make sure that what we are automating is already, uh, that, that we're in a good place in terms of cleaning up eligibility issues, and other you know, basic functional issues with the current law. We also need to eliminate that misdemeanor lifetime limit, and we need to make sure that any other eligibility criteria that we have, a computer is easily gonna be able to find it. We are kind of pursuing on, on separate tracks that hopefully come together, both automating the system and expanding our eligibility. So like I said earlier, a lot of states their, their automation started small and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. So even if at the beginning, say a direct path for, for felony cases to expungement is petition-based, we still want to pursue that. So then ultimately we can get those cases uh, to be automated as well. We need to improve the data systems that we talked about. And what a number of states have done too is to say, even in a petition-based system, if someone files the correct paperwork, instead of going through this discretionary process with judges, 
If you meet the basic criteria, that expungement happens. Once you get to that place where I file the paperwork, judge has to grant it. If I've just checked a couple of the right boxes, that again makes the case for automation because there, there's really not a whole lot of reason not to just automate the process at that point. So that's an option for us to pursue. If the state isn't ready or willing to, to automate, then we can move to try to make more petitions mandatory for the court to grant, which then helps the argument to then move to automation. And then finally, what we always want to do in our work is build diverse coalitions. It, where there is power in numbers. Um, we're grateful to have so many of you here today. And so moving forward and trying to uh, bring Clean Slate, bring expanded eligibility to Georgia, we need to have a number of voices at the table with a varying number of perspectives. Uh, one of those perspectives that we've been fortunate to, to have at the table has been uh, those of employers. Employers have kind of grown to appreciate the reality uh, that you see on the slide here that uh, those with criminal records are far more likely to be unemployed than those without, that those who get a job are only half as likely to be arrested again than those who don't have a job. And also that those with records have been proven to be very quality employees. Uh, there are studies now that show that workers who have a record tend to be more motivated, uh, experience better retention with their employers, and are even promoted faster than those who don't have a record. Employers are starting to appreciate this while also enjoying those strong liability protections that Brenda mentioned earlier. So we have corporations like Microsoft who are now publicly supporting the clean slate movement because they see that uh, when a state removes unnecessary barriers to reaching expungement, that benefits not just those with the record, but also the communities and uh, the, the state at large. So here you can find a quote from Microsoft's vice president of US government affairs uh, supporting a clean slate movement in New York. Now, I do want to just end here with speaking briefly about our policy agenda for 2023. The legislative session is only a month away. So I want to start with, excuse me, what we're going to take on this coming year to try to start down that roadmap that we laid out. The first two bullet points on the roadmap that we had were cleaning up current law and removing the misdemeanor lifetime limit. So that's exactly what our bill is gonna to try to do this year. So you can check our website, sign up for updates uh, to, to see the progress of that bill and to support it as it moves forward. We do have other priorities for this year. Uh, you see all three of our priorities uh, here on the slide. First is uh, to open access to occupational licensing. We're gonna talk more about that for just a moment uh, in, in just a second here as well as enabling victim-centered programs to, to function. So what that refers to is uh, victim-centered programs that operate as an alternative to the traditional criminal legal system. We need, uh, for, for those types of programs where the, the uh, person who has experienced harm and the person who's been alleged to uh, have caused harm to come together and have uh, a discussion and, and talk together about what accountability and healing looks like. For those settings, for those types of programs to function, again, instead of the traditional criminal legal system from handling a case, what we need is to make sure that those conversations are protected, that what somebody says in those types of programs can't then be used against them in a later prosecution. For occupational licensing, what we want to do is make sure that people with criminal records have the ability to follow their goals, their career goals. One in seven jobs in Georgia requires an occupational license. So if you want to be a barber or a nurse or, you know, many, many, many professions in this state, you have to go to the state to uh, get a license to move forward. There's a number of barriers then that somebody with a record might run into. I won't get too deep into all of our barriers and all of our potential reforms, but the big idea is to improve the process so that people with records have clarity as to whether or not 
they can pursue education and training in their field of choice, and also to streamline what records are being considered uh, so that folks aren't being held out because of irrelevant, old, expunged, or pardoned records. And then finally, we just want to bring due process to, to the, the, the process of going through uh, obtaining a license. So you can stay in touch with us and you can get involved in a number of ways. Um, you can stay involved by talking to electeds. Uh, you can host events on the ground, like the expungement summits that Brenda described we work on, working with prosecutors, working with your local judges to try to expand relief to the most amount of people possible. And then also, we, we love to hear your story. Often legislators are moved by the stories that they hear. So feel free to email me. My email will be on the next slide. If, say, you have three or more misdemeanor convictions and you think that your story might help, um, even if we anonymously share it with legislators so they can understand why the current law is holding people back. Uh, and then finally, you can sign up to receive action alerts throughout the legislative session. We'll, we'll send an email following up from this. I know a bunch of stuff is in the chat right now, but we'll also send out some helpful links along with the recording of, of this webinar. So we've got a couple minutes. I think we've got about five minutes for any questions that, that folks might have. And did we have any questions that came in the Q&A? I've been able to answer most of them in writing. There's one that's in there right now, but it's very specific to a personal case. So that's probably better to respond to privately. Okay. Um, oh, can we put our contact information up for the host again? Sure. I, um, I'll put I... it in. The... Okay, yeah, if you can put it in the chat. And I think we're probably gonna send the slides out afterwards. Is that right, Ann? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we really appreciate everyone being here with us today and all the the support that you have shown the, in the efforts to get us to this place. We know we have a long ways to go, um, but you know we're looking forward to to being on that hopefully short journey <laughs> with you to to get to a better place and to get to clean slate. So thank you so much, everyone. One more question that's in the chat, oh. which I think is a really good one. Okay. Is what resources, federal or state grants, exist to help counties convert thousands of Manila court case files and dozens of papers into each digital case management system? Yeah, there there are some federal funds out there for that purpose. Um, you know, obviously that's not something that that we can facilitate. Um, we really we need to get some state actors who are really invested in the idea of improving the system and moving us towards a unified system. And our hope is that the, that bill that Wade talked about that passed this year that created this committee to look at the data issues will, um, will result in some of that interest and commitment to pursuing that. So far, um, we haven't been too excited about the movement that that committee has shown. Um, but we know that there are leaders like the the Metro Chamber and the Georgia Chamber that are very invested and probably have you know more sway down at the Capitol than we do. So hopefully they'll they'll continue working on um, cleaning up those data issues so that we can move closer to clean slate. I think this might be the most on time we've ever been. <laughs> so thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you to Ms. Marilyn Wynn and Reverend Vaughn. We are so grateful for, for your support. And yeah, thank you, everyone. And have a good holiday season.